My brother called me the other day. He didn't mention Raleigh last week. Well, I'm mentioning Raleigh this morning. So get off my case, will you? That's, it's a good day. Uh, and elsewhere, it's a joy to be in the house of the Lord. Three quick things. One, thank you for going to vote this past uh, week. I trust you all voted. There are record turnouts uh, we've all been reading and hearing on the news. How uh, the long lines, and I heard, I saw one place in uh, Georgia, people waited eight to nine hours in line for the privilege and the right to vote. That's how seriously many of us have taken our citizenship responsibility. I saw one case where you saw the same story, a 102-year-old woman, she's walking up to the polls with a walker, 102 years old. And uh, I was so inspired by her, and she was a black woman, but still able to walk. And uh, she says she had voted in every election since 1950. Oh, give me a heart attack here, let me see. 1950, 50 plus 20, 70 years of voting. She did not miss a single election, and she was not going to miss this one. I was impressed with our young people turning out to vote this year. Uh, those who are in college or college age, and, or those under 30, uh, they turn out in massive numbers, I'm told. And so, you know, the democratic process works. I remember in 1991, I was in the Soviet Union on a, on a business trip, and I was remember talking to our guide who said to us, there's more democracy in Russia than there is in the United States. And so I, I try to challenge that statement, and, and she says, there are more people who vote here for our candidates for office than you do in America. And I said, that's not true. And then she gave me a sobering statistic. She said that your last election, only 47% of those eligible to vote voted. And of that 47%, those are the ones, the majority of whom elected your president. So if you take 24 of that, makes it in half, only 24% were qualified that voted for the winner of the, of the election during that year. This year, though, uh, we had massive turnouts. And so thank you, and I think the democratic process works. And it works if we don't take it for granted. So uh, we're moving into a new direction. Uh, secondly, I want to encourage you, as I do every Sunday, to uh, tune in on uh, Tuesday mornings at 9 o'clock for prayer time and devotion time, and at noon on Tuesdays for Bible study. And then again at 7 o'clock, you are welcome to do so. Uh, this past Monday, our church participated in a food giveaway uh, ministry campaign. There are many in the Greer Heights community here in Charlotte who are in need of food and food stuffs, and so our church joined with the Edgar Baptist Church and others in our community and bringing food and assistance to those who need it. That's what we're supposed to do. Amen? To help those who are in need. And so we're doing that here at the Muir Heights uh, Presbyterian Church. So thank you so, so very much. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy God, our Father, once again, we are blessed to be here this morning to celebrate life and to come together in the wake of the uh, this past week's election. But our prayer time and our worship time has nothing to do with the outcome of the election on a few days ago. We come in the name of Jesus Christ, the Eternal One, the Lord of hosts, the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace. We come in that name that is above every other name. At that name, every knee bows and every knee confesses. So we gather here today around our phones and our computers and our homes, and we're lifting up this name by whom we live and move and have being. Father, we pray that you meet those who are ailing with ill health, and several of us this time are sick. We know that in our congregation, we know that those, that those who have strokes, we pray for them. Those who are in the hospital, even as we are having this moment of worship, 
We remember them and we pray for healing in their bodies. And we pray so not because they are appropriate words to say, but Lord, we trust you to be the healer that you are. And we commend to you those who are struggling with their health. Others are grieving the loss of loved ones whom you call the glory. Have mercy upon them. We lift them up today in Jesus' name and for our congregation that they remain together and strong and vibrant. We thank you for every woman, every man, every family, every child in this community of faith. We pray that we will continue to move forward in unity and strive to be the very best we can be for the sake of your kingdom. Now, Lord, we pray your blessing upon this word that I'll be bringing this morning. Give me utterance. Keep my mind clear, my heart pure, as I lift up this word today from Ephesians. I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, I trust that you do. Open them, please, to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. And we're going to go all the way over to verse 22. Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Amen? Here's what it says. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you who are no longer, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. I am excited today on this Word. Uh, this has been a harrowing week. I suspect to you as well because we were waiting on, on pins and needles for the results to come in this past week on uh, Tuesday evening and maybe even some races are still being considered. Uh, this has been a year of uh, uh, electioneering and, 
and I'm so glad the, the campaign is over. Uh, I'm really fatigued at watching all these political campaign ads. Uh, couldn't believe any of them because they all spoke of exaggeration and about the, their opponents. And so, <laughs> if you weren't careful, you would be tempted to think that the, the commercials had some semblance of truth. But I'm so glad that's behind us now. We can get back to the reality of uh, building our, our nation and our communities. My topic today is, we are still one. We are still one. We are still one. Now I know that sounds a bit strange because you say, oh no, we have all this diversity among us, all these differences. I'll get to that in a moment. But that's my topic. We are still one. The election is over. So I have these questions for you. Did your candidate win? Were you happy with the results? What will you do now? To whom do you now pledge to work for? To live for? Did the outcome of the election give you a new sense of perspective for your own life and for the status, the health, and the welfare of your home and your community? Somebody said years ago, all politics is local. We had a national election, we had statewide elections, we had city elections, but I think there's some truth to that. All politics are local. Because what affects you the most? Obviously what happens in Washington DC may have some direct or indirect bearing on your life, but not as much as the local election. I hope you remember a few weeks ago I said to you that the church has a candidate and his name is Jesus Christ. And I said to you his platform is simple. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men and women and children unto me. A very simple platform but one that we need to remember is so true. Not a lot of platitudes or promises or complicated plans. Just lift my name up and see if I'll draw all my men and women and children unto me. So here we are, post-election 2020. So I have three points that I typically do every Sunday, but I want to hit my first point. Numbers sometimes lie. Now, when I was in school, I was my, my I was a, believe it or not, at one point in life, I was a pretty good math student. I don't see how I am now, but at one point, I used to enjoy uh, algebra and uh, geometry and even a little bit of trigonometry, which now they don't teach anymore. But I remember the teacher getting up in front of the class one day and saying, "Numbers don't lie." Numbers are facts. You can't argue with the facts. Well, that depends on who's putting together the numbers. Because statistics can lie, and information about numbers can lie. Even though one and one should equal two, sometimes one and one equals some other number that somebody has fabricated for themselves. In our nation, we have the strange use of language we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. And the notion is that all men are created equal. So we have in our Pledge of Allegiance, our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We are one nation under God, one nation under God, indivisible, so says the language of our Pledge of Allegiance. Well, uh, I read it all my life since elementary school. I recited that pledge. You go to ball games, you put your hand over your heart and you recite the pledge. And of course, the words of the Pledge of Allegiance make sense. But not many people, I don't think, believe that we're really one. Somehow there's a disconnect between our Pledge of Allegiance and the way we live our lives as Americans or as fellow citizens in Christ. We have splinter groups, we have racial groups, we have ethnic groups, 
We have different philosophies. We have different classes, different neighborhoods, different churches we go to. When I first moved to Charlotte 11 years ago, I was impressed by a constant question I kept hearing over and over again. In fact, I hadn't, I hadn't encountered that before. So for the past 11 years, I've learned to live with the question. So you meet somebody, and you'll introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Reggie. Tell them what is your name, and they'll give you their name. And then the next question is, what church do you go to? I was taken aback by that. So it was Yvette. Why are they interested in the church you will go to? But I heard that question. Ever happened to you? What church do you go to? I go to this one, I go to that one, I go to this one. And then the next question, where do you live? Ah, what neighborhood do you live in? And Charlotte is a community of different neighborhoods, all having their own individual names. Interesting. Which is to suggest the church you go to and the neighborhood you live in somehow defines who you are. Hmm. So are we one or more than one? Numbers sometimes lie. We have these different philosophies on how to live life. Do I live life to include everybody or do I live life to exclude some? Maybe they don't dress the way I dress or walk the way I walk. Maybe they have a different gender selection for their sexual preferences. I don't know. Maybe they're white or black. Maybe they're Republican or Democrat. I don't know if I really want to include everybody as my equal. Don't believe the lie that our differences truly make us divided. Okay, here's one for you. I'll tell you why numbers lie. When I was a boy growing up in Denver, Colorado, I used to hear over and over and over again, maybe you heard the same thing I heard. Color doesn't matter, you know. It really doesn't matter. I don't see color. I heard that so many times and so much to the point I thought it was true. Then I got older and I got wiser and I said that is not a true statement. Color does matter and it matters in the lives of almost everybody who sees anybody. Mother Ruth Grief in our church in New York, we had a significantly, kind of large church board, Presbyterian church, we had about a, almost a thousand members, but we had it was a church that migrated from a small church to a bigger church, and most of the white members in the community moved out in the space of three years. Roosevelt was a community mostly white in 1972, but by, by, by 1974 it had become mostly black. White flight, they called it. Mother Ruth Grief, oldest woman in the church, was white. She was born in that church in, back in 1920. She didn't leave. Her neighbors left. In fact, some of them came and told her, you better leave, Ruth. The community is changing. You're going to get, uh, those days, Negro neighbors. Your property values are going to go down. You better get out while the getting out is good. And one of the neighbors said to her, can't you see? Your neighbors are going to be different than what you look like. And I never shall forget her response to one of her neighbors. She told me the story. She says, I see what you see, but it doesn't matter. Oh, that is a wise woman. She saw that her new neighbors were black, but in her mind, it didn't matter. And I've come to appreciate that statement all the more. Because the truth is, when I see people, I want them to see me, all of me, and then to conclude to themselves, it doesn't matter. I accept you. I embrace you. Your life has value to me. And when I hear that, I say, okay, they finally graduated from that parochial way of thinking and the thinking that, you know what, we can be different and still be one. We are still one. Point number two is this. I'm reading over Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Galatians 6, verse 2. Interesting words. It says, share each other's troubles and problems. And this way, obey the law of Christ. 
And I'm going to, I want you to note here, this is not a, a request. It is not an optional point of our existence. It's, it's shared. It's a, it's a requirement. It's a command. Share. In other words, work to build true bridges of unity. And how do we do that? How do we build bridges of unity? I'm going to give you some examples. One of the ways that we do not build bridges of unity is when we have parts of our community living in economic disparity and we say nothing, we do nothing, we look as if we don't even see them. That's not building a bridge of unity. We have decades and decades of people living disparate lives and who've been disenfranchised and nobody says a word about them, then that's not building a bridge of unity. I want people in power sitting in boardrooms and sitting in corporate offices and sitting in town hall, city hall, who have the power to make a difference by the social policies that they create and enact to benefit all of the residents of Charlotte and not just those who are privileged. That's how we build a bridge of unity. We are still one. I am foolish enough, I am foolish enough to believe that we still can be one. Our Lord teaches that we are required to share each other's troubles and burdens. I can't walk away. I, do, I, I would be held in contempt if I saw a person in need or a situation that is so far gone that needs assistance and I walked away from the opportunity to help, the Lord would spank me good. You had a chance to offer some food and you did not shelter and you provided not. You had a chance to go to City Hall and pound the desk and say to the city officials, make a difference for those who cannot spend for themselves. Make our nation and make our city one, not divided because of class or because of race. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he says something very peculiar here in the second chapter. And it's, it's, it's so poignant, it's so meaningful for our day and time because in the, in the 11th verse of Ephesians chapter 2, he says, Formerly you were divided, some were considered Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised. And you were called uncircumcised by those who were of the circumcision. You know, the Jews who believed the circumcision and the Gentiles who didn't practice circumcision. They were looked down upon by the Jews. So they divided themselves by, by religious practice of circumcision. So they developed a classification called foreigners and immigrants who were not in a position to benefit from the privileges and the laws and the blessings of being part of the community of Israel. And then it says in verse 13, but now Christ Jesus has come to make us one, to set aside whether you are uncircumcised or circumcised, whether you are foreigner or not, in Jesus Christ we are one. Number, that number does not lie. We have to grow into living it. There's a song we sometimes sing in our church, in Christ there is no east or west in him, no north or south. I love that song. It's rather ethereal and, 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 and rather abstract. In Christ there is no east or west in him, no north or south. I know what the words say. It's meant to be inclusive. It's meant to point to the fact that we are one and then here comes that devil, the rascal, the devil, that, that rascal, the devil, telling us that we're not one. You're not white, you're black. You're not black, you're white. You're not poor, you have privilege. Don't you know that you're a Democrat? You can't love a Republican. Are you crazy? Here you are, American. You can't allow all these foreigners to come into this nation. How can we afford to pay for their health care or their education? Keep them out. We forget the fact that those foreigners come into this country. I agree we cannot feed the whole world. But every woman and man coming across the border 
is our brother and our sister. They are part of the human race, and that race is one. So Paul writes in the church, it says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one. So whatever differences we may live by in our society, our faith teaches us, that's why I love being a Christian, and I'm not ashamed to say that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that I willingly and gladly embrace, embrace each other in spite of our differences in Christ we are made one. So, if I'm to be one in Christ, shame on me if I lift up our differences, you see. And make it seem as if our differences are the things that really matter. I must share the burdens of our neighbors, the burdens of food and shelter uh, inequity. I must respond to the notions of economic uh, empowerment and create some semblance of health care uh, access. Create opportunities for those who are released from prison to re-enter harmoniously back into society. We have 2.4 million people behind bars, many of whom, in fact most of whom are African American. When they come home from their time in prison, how do they re-enter our society? Are we doing it, or do we just simply look down our nose and say, shame on you, you got what you deserve, now get away from me, I don't trust you, you have a criminal record. That man, that woman, they have a family, perhaps, a wife and children, and as long as we reject them, they'll go back to their old ways. They've got to live, they're going to live somehow. Either knock you over your head, knock you over mine, and take what I have, take what belongs to you. We need to exercise more sensitivity to those who have been released from prison. We have to teach those who continue to oppress us, you know, the evil that they are doing. I have participated in this in Charlotte so many times in, in forums and in discussion groups with, with white individuals and others talk about how can we bring about uh, reconciliation in Charlotte. I've grown tired of trying to teach, I thought, and then the devil, the, excuse me, the Lord pricked my conscience and said, Reggie, that is your responsibility to educate and to teach those who don't know that we are one. Don't forget, I'm so glad that we have this expression and we say it often, no justice, no peace. I know some quarters don't want to hear that because it suggests agitation, that we're about to destroy something to get something. I know we've had demonstrations this year. Some of them have bordered on uh, moving towards violence. Some have been violent. That's unfortunate because that's not what the demonstrations are about. But we must agitate and we must protest against injustice. So there should be no peace in the presence of injustice. And we as Christians, you and I, all of us, have a responsibility to bring about a sense of justice and not lay down and sit down and pretend injustice doesn't exist. There is injustice. And that's why many of you went to the poll this past Tuesday. And that's why some of us continue to labor on behalf of those who cannot pin for themselves or even have a voice to speak for themselves. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 12, verse 18, I love this expression because it says, do everything possible on your part to live in peace with everybody. Do everything possible on your part to live in peace with everybody. I'm going to paraphrase again and say, but do not neglect justice. This is not the time to be quiet and to pretend as if everything goes back to the way things were. We still have brothers and sisters who are laboring, trying to survive. We have a responsibility to be part of their lives by fighting for what is just. And it's, but our silence does not promote Justice. 
Our silence promotes injustice. And so we speak in love, but we speak through our Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, my last point is this. It says, remember that formerly you were called by birth. You were called by birth. That's what it says in verse 11. Formerly you were called by birth Gentiles or Jews. Now remember that we are not two or three or a hundred or a thousand nationalities or races or political parties or genders or languages. When all is said and done, our blood still is red. If you shoot me, I'll bleed. If you cut me, I'll experience pain. If I go without food, I'll feel the hunger. I have no shelter, I'll catch pneumonia. We must constantly remind all others that we are one, and that no one of us is better than, and no one of us is less than anyone else. We are one. So that's what our church is about. All churches ought to be about oneness, not about divisiveness, but about oneness. So I hope our nation comes together. No matter who you voted for this past week, we still are a nation that proclaims we are one. Not a thousand and one. We are one people. And we have to make sure that everyone has the same privileges and opportunities as anyone else may have in our society. We are transformed not by an election, but we're transformed by the truth. And that's what it says in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus says, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciple indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And that truth is, my brothers and sisters, is we are one people. Differences, yes, but respected by all. And I say to you, you must respect me. You must respect me. You may not like me, but you must respect me. I may not like you, but I will respect you. I respect you in spite of our differences. Because in Jesus Christ, we are one. Our freedom is found in the truth that we are one and not many. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for that lesson and for your salvation. Amen. Lord, we come to the end of this moment, but we thank you for this opportunity to read Ephesians chapter 2. And to be reminded that through the cross, everybody comes to you and we are the same. Although we may be many and we are different, in your eyes we are one. In Christ there is no east or west, in him there is no north or south. And we thank you that we have this lesson today. It is in your name that we accept it. It is in your name that we walk, live, and breathe it. Hallelujah. Thank you.